Chapter 22, Another Day at Work. Another bugle call, the end of the noon meal, and the start of the industrial part of my day. My academic sessions run from just after breakfast till lunch, 7.30 a.m. till noon. Every student spends half the day in academic and half the day in industrial. In my case, the industrial parts in the afternoon from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. That suits me fine. Those who have industrial in the morning are often so worn out from the hard labor that they fall asleep in their afternoon classes. Not that there's much to stay awake for. In eighth grade geography class, where the red mustache bald-headed teacher is Mr. Mallet, we learned the startling news today that the Earth is round and called a planet. Also that North America is a continent. Then Mr. Mallet put his feet up on his desk and went back to reading one of the magazines he buries himself in during every class. Like the other awful teachers here, He's been working for the Indian Education Service for years. Teaching for him just means coming into class each day, taking the role, saying a word or two, and then spending the rest of his time sucking his mustache and reading cheap magazines. He doesn't even give tests. All we are expected to do is not interrupt his concentration on the pictures in the police gazette until a bugle sounds. We don't do much studying. There's not enough geography books for every student. Only five or six battered texts older than Mr. Mallet himself. So most of the students stuck in here every day either stare out the window or lower their heads down on their desks and doze off. Today, when I looked around the room, the only person awake aside from me was Possum, reading The Call of the Wild. He's a slow reader, mouthing every word and going back to read every page twice, but he's told me half a dozen times he loves the book, especially the freedom in it. Me, I've used the time to scribble in this journal I've started keeping, sort of like the one Pop kept. Writing it, it makes me feel closer to him. Also, it helps me to think about what I might say in another letter to Pop. Another boring day, I start writing. How did you stand it when you were here, Pop? I've written a full page of thoughts like that by the time the academic building's annoying buzzer sounds. It goes off half a minute before the bugle, despite the fact that I've had a month to get used to it. It still irritates the heck out of me when it goes off. It's pitched so loud, it makes my teeth feel like they're being attacked by a dentist drill. Possum walks next to me as we head to our industrial class. Our Chalagi school bags with our books and school supplies are over our shoulders. The bags are more like burlap sacks. The pack I arrived with is a lot better, but that pack was taken from me. Like such personal items as family photos, good clothing, keepsakes and jewelry other Indian students arrived with at the start of the year, my pack is in safe storage in the basement of Building 4. Safe storage, Little Coon explained to me, means anything valuables about likely to still be there when you're allowed to look at your things as a baby chick dropped into a hawk's nest. That pack of mine is empty. The only keepsake I really care about is the France Victory Medal I put in Possum's hidey hole. And I've never owned a photo of Pop. I don't need one. All I need to do is just close my eyes to see his kind face in front of me. But so far, I've not been able to see what he's doing or about to do. That gift of mine of precognition, sort of viewing the future, only kicks in rarely. You look like you are cogitating about something, he says. Cogitating is his word of the day. In exchange for his co continuing to show me the ropes here, being the Virgil showing me the way through the underworld, like Aeneas, I've been finding him a new word each day from my dictionary. I just nod. So what are you cogitating about, Jaybird? Nothing much, I say. In fact, what, I'm, what I am still thinking about is what I might say in my next letter to my father. I've written two of them to him so far, but I haven't sent them. That's because I haven't heard from him yet. So I have no way to know where to mail them. I have them both, written on pages I tore out of my journal, folded up safe inside my copy of Bullfinch's Mythology, right next to the story of Theseus and the Minotaur. I've reread that story three times since I've been here. It makes me wish I could find a magic thread that I could follow to get out of the labyrinth of this Indian school. But then again, it was not Theseus's father who took him to the, into that maze and told him to stay there. I almost mentioned that in my first letter to my father, but I didn't. Nor did I mention the dreams I keep having of being in that dark place, a place without light, where I can't open my eyes or hear or breathe, except in that dream I also know I'm not me. I'm someone else. I pushed that dream away like brushing a spider web from my face as I wrote, Pop, how are you? 
I am fine, but I miss you so much. I am doing okay. I have a couple of friends. One of them is Possum. Remember him? He's the one who showed me around. I guess you know what life is like here, so I don't have to say much about my days. Nights are hard. I have a hard time getting to sleep with what all the noises from the other boys around me. It seems like there is always at least one boy who is crying or wakes up calling for his mom. That is how I learned the word in Creek for mom after hearing it so many times. Ick key. I have been learning other Creek words too. I guess that is funny, isn't it? Here at Chalagi, you get punished for saying even one word in Indian. But whenever the staff is not around, the guys in my gang are always talking Indian. So I came here speaking English, and now I am learning Indian. I am keeping out of trouble. So far, I have only earned a few demerits, and I make sure to stay away from you-know-who. He was bad when you were here, and he's still bad. All the boys talk about him as if he was the boogeyman. I have learned some useful things here, especially about farming. English is not bad, and I have also done well in penmanship. I bet you can see that from my handwriting in this letter, can't you? But the agricultural science classes have been very good. I have learned a lot about poultry. When we have our farm, I think I can be very useful because of what I have been learning. Also on the weekends, I have learned some things from the other boys in our gang. One of them, Little Coon, knows all about animals. We hunt together. I have written a lot in this letter about me. But what I want to know is about you. You must have been in Washington for quite a while now. I saw something in a Tulsa newspaper here at the school about the men like you coming to Washington. It said they were Reds and they wanted to bring down the government. I know that must be wrong. I bet they are just men like you who want a fair deal. I will send this letter to you as soon as you have written me so I know your address. I love you, Pop. I will do my best to make you proud of me. I am your faithful son, Cal. Possum and I take a roundabout, take as a roundabout path as we can to get to the harness shop but not far enough out of the way to make us late. Plus, from the glint of light I see from the top of the water tower, I know we are being watched from any, for any sort of infraction that will add marks to our red cards. We don't want to get any of those demerits that used to earn a boy a whipping back in Pop's time. Now the only official pun punishments are to be assigned extra work or lose privileges, like being able to go into town on a weekend once a month or take part in go-get-togethers. Get but both of us want to breathe the fresh air, listen to the birds that are flocking in ever-increasing numbers back into the trees and fields. So we take the route that leads us closest to the near meadow. Little Coon and I heard a meadow lark singing there just yesterday morning, and we saw the yellow of its breast before it disappeared into the tall grass before the cattle barn. Hear that, Little Coon said. It was talking Indian. Imitik ta tonki, imitik tonki, free time, free time. No matter lark is singing for us today, though. No geese fly over, honking at us to remind us how free they are in their open sky. As we approach the harness shop, I find myself opening and closing my fists, trying to loosen them up. I'm already building calluses on my palms from the leather work. I sometimes wake up nights with my hands curled up like claws from the work of grabbing and manipulating the stiff horse harnesses we're making. Maybe, Possum says, looking down at my feet, we'll get shoe repair duty today. That would be nice. Shoe repair is easier work than the harness making. Then Possum chuckles. And maybe pigs are going to fly. I chuckle too, but I am now looking at my feet too. His words about shoes have reminded me just how uncomfortable mine are getting. I haven't been able to buy a pair of sneakers like his. We earn a few pennies a day from our industrial work, but I have nowhere near enough to buy shoes. I'm stuck with the bull hides. I was issued my first day here. They're heavy, but not sturdy. They were so badly made out of already cheap material that they are starting to fall apart after weeks of my feet being tortured by them. I do have the polished black shoes I wear for marching, as do all the other cadets, but that is all those shoes are for. Either sneakers or work boots have to be worn for the rest of the day. Possum is still studying my busted bull hides. Least we can do today is try to get a couple of nails pounded into them clodhoppers of yours. I nod. Why not get some sneaks like mine, he asks, as we near the harness shop. I reach into my pants and pull out my empty pockets. Possum shakes his head. Didn't your pop leave you no money on a, your account with the school bursar? It's a question that surprises me. Accounts? People do that? That's how I got mine, Possum says. Bought them in town with money my grandma put on my account. You think I have an account, I ask. Possum grins as we enter the harness shop at the exact moment that the bugle sounds. 
Do I look like the bursar? He puffs out his chest, pulls in his shoulders, and messes up his hair so that he almost does look like Mr. Cash, the chubby white man who handles the school's funds. I have to laugh. Look, Possum says. Didn't no one ever explain to you about your account, about accounts? I shake my head. One thing about Superintendent Morell, Possum says. That man is as honest as a June day is long. Believes a man should get paid for his labor. That'll teach us Indians how to be more like white men. Like some white men, I think. Remembering just Jack. So, Possum continues. Every day we might earn a few cents from the industrial work we do. That gets put in our accounts. Summertime, you get paid even more. 35 cents a day for cutting grass. If you get assigned a garden plot, you keep some of the money for what vegetables you grow. Older boys might even be allotted a field to grow hay and grain. That earns you $3 a day. I think about the 30 days I've been here, looking at the calluses and cuts on my hands from the jobs I've been learning in the various shops and barns. It's a good thing I heal fast. And even better, that my reflexes have been quick enough for me to keep from getting more than small injuries. Tell you what, Possum says, as soon as we have the time, I'll walk you to this office, to his office, help you find out. Bird, over here, the heavy nasal voice of Mr. Handler, the head harness and shoe repair instructor, breaks up our conversation. He's a graduate of Chalagi, like most of those who teach trades. He's been employed here since his graduation 20 years ago. He's holding up a heavy handful of harness leather in one thick-fingered hand, cutting tools in the other. Sir, I hustle over to him before he decides I've earned a demerit for typical Indian laziness, as he puts it. Despite the fact he is an Indian himself, a dark-skinned North Carolina Cherokee. Instead of handing me the stuff he's holding right away, though, he looks down at my feet, at the flapping sole of my right shoe to be exact and a look that almost seems concerned actually comes over his face, which usually shows no emotion at all. Son, he says, them the only work boots you got? Yes, sir, I reply. He throws the harness material and two tools down on a bench. Come with me. I follow him to the shoemaking part of the large, low building, back past the local farmer and his team of matched black horses that are being fitted with just-made harnesses. Sit, Mr. Handler commands. Pull them both off. I do as he says. I stand and watch as he takes the first one and then the other in his broad hands, holds them up and studies them. He shakes his head. I sure as blazes did not make this pair, he says. One of my lazy Indian boys done this slipshod job, not worth the powder to blow him to heck. I'm not sure whether he means the shoes or the student who put them together. Probably both. Uppers are not half bad, but these soles? He rips the bottoms of both shoes and sends them soles sends the souls flying like bats across the room, not looking where they land. What he does next happens with such a blur of movement that it is hard for me to follow. Measuring, cutting, fitting, nailing into place. He's done in almost no time at all. Here, he says, tossing me my repaired bull hides. They hit me in the belly so hard that they almost knocked me down, but I managed to grab them. Put them on! I sit to slide on one boot after the other, pull the laces tight and tie them. I stand up, stomp first one foot and then the other. My bull hides are still stiff and heavy, but as I walk back and forth in them, they feel sturdy for the first time. Thank you, I say. You can thank me by getting your butt back to making them harnesses. Yes, sir, I say. Time to build more calluses. Just as Possum described, Mr. Cash is a little white man with a round face and a no-nonsense attitude. We're here to see about Cal Blackbird's account, Possum says. Your name, Mr. Cash said, as if Possum hadn't just identified me. Name, he said again, pointing his pencil at me like it was a gun. Blackbird. Cal, I replied. Spell it. Mr. Cash says, licking his index finger and then using it to open a thick green ledger book. I spell it as he runs the eraser end of his pencil down the page. Calvin, he asks in a voice about as neutral as a blank sheet of paper. Yes, sir. 13 and 28, he says, tapping a line of writing so small I cannot read it. Sir, dollars and cents. 10 left on account, 3 and 28 earned. He opens a drawer. 5, he says, sir, all I can disperse per month, 5. He holds out 5 $1 bills. I look over at Possum. He holds up three fingers. His Converse All-Stars cost three bucks. Then he shrugs and holds up another finger just in case. Four's enough, I say. As we walk back toward our dorm, I'm feeling happy. 
It's not just because I'll finally be able to have a pair of comfortable shoes, new ones at that. It's because Pop left money for me. For a moment, it felt like as if he were here with me. Just a brief moment. But that and the prospect of my own kids has put some sunshine into my heart. Best thing about this, Possum says, is that today's Friday and tomorrow we have got us a town day. I know just the place for you to pick up a fine pair of sneakers just like mine. Oh, Boyle's Dry Goods. He grins over at me. They sell penny candy, too. Good thing I got this extra dollar, I grin back at him. Saturday morning. Possum and me and a dozen other boys are riding the back of the school wagon, sent into town to pick up harness, school, harness shop supplies. It's being driven by Mr. Handler, who saw us walking and ordered us to hop on board in that gruff voice of his, which I now realize covers up a soft heart. Hard as the work in his shop is, and as useless as it may be in this new world where cars are surely going to take the place of horses, he really wants to teach us the right way to do things. Unlike most of the academic teachers who are lifetime employees just looking to serve out their term before retiring, I am quieter than usual. Not that anyone notices since quieter than usual just means only saying a word or two every hour as opposed to every half hour. I ought to be happy getting away from the school routine and heading out to do something special. But being away from Chalagi, seeing the open road ahead of the wagon reminds me of all the roads Pop and I walked together over the last year. I'm doing what he wanted me to do, but I am still worried about him out there without me to look out for him. I hope I hear from him soon. Possum nudges me in the ribs. Thinking about them new shoes, he asks. I guess I should be. So I nod and then go back to watching the rows, the road ahead as the horses clop along. O'Boyles is not our first shop in town. That first stop, which was along our way, is the train depot where we help unload some boxes being shipped east. Thinking of hitching a freight, Jaybird? Possum asks. I just smile as I study the train schedule, reading it from top to bottom, bottom to top. Then back down again until I figure I have it mix fixed in my mind. Done, Possum says. Done, I reply. Shoes now? Shoes. Five minutes later, we're in O'Boyles. No other customers are there as I walk up to the counter where a huge red-haired man is smiling down at us both. Shoes, I'd wager, he says, looking at my feet. I nod and I'm handed a pair of black kids. I sit down, slip them on, lace them up. They fit my feet like a second skin. So what do you think, Possum says. I stand and walk back and forth down the crowded aisle of O'Boyles, being careful not to knock over any of the various size boxes piled precariously on all sides and filled with all sorts of stuff. Whatever you need, we have got it. That's what the sign outside read. From the way every inch of the store is cluttered with goods, it just might be true were it not for the fact that the one thing Mr. O'Boyle does not sell is books. Aside from the copies of King James Bible, of which he has half a dozen offered at a quarter each, I take another step, then hop up in the air and land without making a sound. It's as if my feet have springs under them with those thick rubber soles. Yes, indeed he do, the ruddy-cheeked proprietor says. He rubs his huge palms together so hard you'd think he was trying to start a fire. Plimsolls was what they called them when they first at attached rubber to the sole of a shoe. Then in 92, along came the U.S. Rubber Company with their canvas tops. It was they who named them Keds. I nod. Possum had warned me that anything bought at O'Boyle's would come with an explanatory lecture from the store's owner, who was a history buff and would have been a better teacher than most of those heading up our classes. Sneakers, folks started calling him. That was on account of how easy it was to sneak up on a man, them shoes being so silent and all. But what you have on there, young man, for the price of but $2.98 are Chuck Taylor All-Stars, named for the famed Indiana hoop star himself. He cocks his head to look at me, rubs his hands together even harder. You like them shoes, Chief? You want to buy them? I sigh inwardly at his attempt to talk the way some Indians do whose English isn't good. But there's no use in trying to correct him. I just nod my head and hand him three dollars.